Explain how this lab study was conducted, the engineering of the virus uh, to replicate the variant first discovered in South Africa, uh, and what were some of the findings that your study revealed? Yes, we used the reverse genetic system to engineer three viruses. So the first virus, we engineered the complete spike mutations. As you know, spike is the protein that is on the surface of the virus that is responsible for attaching the cells and then infect the cells. That's the first mutant. The second mutant we made is we mutated the three mutations that recovered, recovered from the South African strain that reside in the receptor binding domain, which is the region that directly interacts with the receptor of the cell and enters the cell. So that's the second mutant engineer. The third mutant we engineered is a deletion outside that receptor binding domain, still within the spike region. We made those three mutant viruses using the engineering, and then side by side, we compare with the original Y-type virus without the spike mutation. And then what we did with those four viruses, we tested a panel of blood from the vaccinated individuals. And then for each of those blood, we test against all those four viruses, and we can quantify how much effect of each of these mutations that contributes to the reduction of the neutralizing activities from the, from the vaccinated blood. So just to summarize for the people watching, essentially you have three uh, mutations of the 501YV2 uh, variant, which was first discovered in South Africa. You then tested the efficacy of, the, of vaccinated people, 15 vaccinated persons that received two doses of the, the Pfizer BioNTech against these variants. And what did you find? So what we found is with the full spike, mutation from the South African variants. And there is about two thirds of reduction of the neutralizing activity. So if let's say the, the original uh, against the white type virus is 600, the neutralizing activity, two thirds of the reduction will make it to around 200. And so those are the findings we found. And then we found the subset of the mutations, the other two mutants, which contains the receptor binding domain and another deletion region, they, the effect, the subset effect is much less. So translate that for, for people that aren't, you know, don't work in the science field like, like, like you do. Essentially what you're saying is there's a two thirds reduction in the efficacy of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine against the variant found in South Africa, but that it still neutralizes the virus, correct? Yes. So I would say, I would not say that reduce the two thirds of the efficacy. I would say it reduced the neutralizing activity of the antibodies by twofold. Because the neutralizing antibodies is just the one of the ways of our immune system to protect us after our vaccination. There are other protective uh, immunities, such as the T cells and other immune responses, which will also come to play to protect us. So by reducing twofold of the antibody activity doesn't mean to reduce the efficacy at all. So I would say, yeah, two thirds of the neutralizing activity has been reduced. So in terms of the efficacy, just in layman's terms, talk to what, how, how effective it is against this variant. Is it going to save lives? Is it going to prevent mild disease, severe disease? What, what really does it mean? I would think still the vaccine will still be able to help us to prevent severe disease and, and the death. And because right now in the scientific field, we still don't know the minimum requirement of the antibody levels that is required to protect us from being infected or severe disease or death. So that number remains to be defined. So that's why I say by reducing two thirds, let's say starting from 600 to 200, this 200 might still be a, a way above the threshold that is able to protect us from being infected and severe disease particularly.
So, uh, Professor, we understand now that Pfizer and BioNTech are working to develop and seek authorization for updated mRNA vaccine boosters uh, once the strain that significantly reduces the protection from the current vaccine is identified. Just speak to this mRNA technology and how easily it will be for them to adapt current vaccines to uh, better mitigate against the the new variants that are, are emerging. Well, mRNA, one of the advantage of the mRNA is very flexible. That is able to change the sequences based on the new variants and then put it into the same uh, formulations that can be getting to the, the, the new booster format. And I think, but of course, there are still a lot of uh, regulatory processes and the scientific uh, validation needs to be done. And, and I'm sure that the companies are working very closely together with the regulatory agencies to get that channel approved. And so that if there is a need of doing so, that can be quickly delivered. So final question for you, Professor. Do you have any understanding of the uh, reduced efficacy of some of the other vaccines? We know Moderna is also using mRNA technology, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Astra, uh, AstraZeneca. Can you just speak to what you are seeing in terms of the efficacy of the other vaccines against the new strains? I think we we will we absolutely uh, uh, expect the virus will continue to evolve, and the, the findings we 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 identify with the Pfizer vaccine in general could be applicable to the other vaccines because the sequences, one way or the other, are very similar. And I think the approaches uh, we've been taken proactively to get those scientific foundations to give guidance to whether. Uh, there is a need of a booster for the next generation of that vaccine. And I think the scientific communities and the vaccine companies need to work together towards that direction. So in a nutshell, this is still very much a work in progress. Absolutely. Professor Pei Yong Shi, thank you very much indeed for speaking with us. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Professor Shi is the Vice Chair of Innovation and, and Commercialization in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Texas medical branch.